Pilots is a volunteer group dedicated to reducing general aviation accidents by providing free and low-cost training and safety resources for pilots. Our speaker today is Gary Reeves. Nice voice. Gary has over 6,000 hours, is an ATP and a master flight, instrument, and multi-engine instructor. He is a young Eagles flight leader for the EAA and a nationally recognized expert in Garmin avionics, IFR, iPad use, and mountain flying. In 2016, <coughs> Gary was awarded the FAA Instructor of the Year for the Western Pacific region, which includes Arizona, California, Hawaii, and Nevada. Have lost oh, there are 112,000 instructors in the U.S. Less than 800 have ever been named Master. California only has 13. Please welcome 2016 Western Pacific Regional Instructor of the Year and Master CFI, Gary Reeves. <coughs> That's hilarious. Uh, George actually typed clap, clap, clap. Um, it's actually amazing. I sound really good on paper, but I am certainly <laughs> very honored to be here. Um, people ask me, well, you know, what do you do? For a living. Well, I volunteer all my time for pilot safety. What I do for a living is I run a company called masterflighttraining.com. I'm uh, I travel all over the US and Canada. So if you have a Garmin 430 G1000 or GTN in your plane and you'd like me to come, I'm more than happy to come to you anywhere in the country or Canada and do one-on-one -on -one training. I'm also nationally recognized uh, for IFR training iPad training, and I do a lot of really interesting mountain flying trips. So, uh, you know, I always sound pretty impressive in my bio. I just hope one day I'm as cool as this guy who's sitting next to me eating a piece of pizza and laughing. This is John Mahaney. He has over 9,000 hours of flat time. He's been a CFI for over 35 years. Previous airline, charter, and corporate pilot. He's taught thunderstorms, icing, and turbulence. He's been a flight safety King Air Citation and Cessna 300-400 series instructor. There you go. Went to uh, Archie Trammell's Airborne Weather Radar class twice and is a five-time Master CFI, and I'm only a two-time <laughs> Master CFI. Now, what's funny is that John and I have been friends for a long time, and I'm the 2016 Western Pacific Instructor of the Year. John, what year did you win that? Oh, gosh, three and five. Yes. So he's won that twice. <laughs> so everything I have, he's just done more and sooner. But he's an amazing guy, and he's older, here. And just older. He says, he just says older. So uh, let's talk about the FAA safety team. Uh, the FAA safety team was mandated to reduce general aviation accidents. In the same year, Congress cut their budget to essentially nothing. So 90% of the FAA safety team are volunteers. We'd love to have you join as well. Um, the biggest thing I hear is I'm not an instructor. We don't care. A student pilot who cares about general aviation safety can make a huge difference and we would love to have you. Of course, this webinar is provided by pilotsafety.org and we hope you visit that. Let's get right into it with case study one. This was an accident involving mountain wave turbulence and rotor clouds. Give you a little background on this one. Oh, and uh, I, I'm sure I mentioned it. If you have a question anytime, please use the questions feature. Uh, we have several hundred people online tonight. We can't get to them all, but we'll try our very best. So the background on the first accident is a 6,300 hour commercial pilot and flight instructor. He was a very experienced Cirrus employee with a lot of times in Cirrus. It was a day VFR trip. Simple trip down from San Carlos, California to Paso Robles, California. He'd flown the route before many times, but he did not get a weather brief. So let's look at a witness statement from the NTSB docket. The pilot's friend proceeded outside his residence to watch the airplane while speaking with the pilot on the telephone. 
He noted that the winds were from the east, about 40 miles an hour. He observed that the airplane drop 1,000 feet as it was flying towards his house in a nose-high configuration with full power still dropping. He heard the telephone drop. The airplane made a rapid ascent as it neared some power lines, climbing in a near-vertical nose-high maneuver to about 1,000 feet AGL. It sep subsequently made a 90-degree pivot and continued to turn into a barrel roll, disappearing behind the tree line. The friend noted that he heard the engine producing full power during the maneuver. So I'm sure all of you out there are saying, well, that's not a barrel roll, that's a stall spin. And yeah, that's exactly what happened. Let me show you kind of a map of the flight path and how he cleared those power lines. It's a little easier to see from the side. And I'm going to highlight the power lines for you. So we had this Cirrus flying with a 40 knot tailwind, which would explain why he was at a nose high altitude, full power, but still sinking. Then when he realized he was going to hit the power lines, he pitched up even more to an almost near vertical just to clear the power lines. And unfortunately, in a high, nose high, full power on stall that was pretty clearly um, not coordinated, that's when he went into what the witnesses describe as a barrel roll. And I think we all agree it's just going to be a spin and impacted. And that's what a CHP helicopter took a picture of 10 minutes later. Now, what's really interesting is that if you look at the smoke, it's just going straight up, which means on the small ridge he was at, the winds were calm at the surface, even though at a couple hundred feet, there was a 40 knot wind from the east. That's a very clear sign of low level wind shear and mountain wave. And if anybody's interested, flying in a 40 knot tailwind and power on stall, this is about what's left of a really nice airplane. And you can see how scattered the debris actually was. So what's interesting is about 45 minutes before he buzzed his friend's house and was talking on the telephone and flying in mountain wave that he didn't realize. And I'm sure he was, you know, making all of those interesting mistakes. There was a pie rep that he didn't know about. So 20 miles southeast of San Luis Obispo, which is only about 15 miles away from the accident site. A pilot report was given at 5,000 feet by a Cessna 172, reported continuous light to occasional moderate turbulence from 2,000 to 5,000, but calm at the surface. Well, when winds are calm at the surface, higher above by 40 knots, that's typically an inversion or mountain wave activity. And this is where I'm going to bring John on board. Okay. This is actually a picture from the NASA satellite. You can actually see some white lines near the accident site, and those are called roll clouds or tubular or arcus clouds. Right. John, can you tell us about what tubular and arcus and roll clouds are? Well, they're uh, it's a lot of, a lot of, basically it's turbulent air. So it's very close to the ground and it's constantly forming and dissipating. It's in a tube-like shape, they call it arcus, and it's you know severe turbulence when you go through there, if you were to get into there. So you obviously want to stay well clear of that. You'd find that on the leeward side of a mountain, you know, on the downdraft. And do you only get turbulence when you're in those clouds? Uh, you could get it. I mean, I would say transitioning, you know, going through. I mean, you're going to have some mechanical turbulence as you approach it. Uh, so in it and then on both sides, probably. Um, 
I mean, there are so many variables with weather that you could get it if you're in the vicinity, but you know, in the heart of it, yeah, it's obviously going to be very nasty. So uh, if you if you be lucky enough to survive it. Right. And what's interesting is uh, I teach a lot of mountain flying and, and John has as well. He spent a lot of time in Alaska. You get turbulence below those clouds as well. You're typically safe above the clouds, but below the clouds, you're going to get that mountain wave and rotor turbulence as well, even though you don't see the condensation. So, John, what are some other types of mountain wave clouds that people should look for? Well, since you've asked, uh, having dug this up, you've got um, lenticular clouds can be broken down into alto cumulus, standing lenticulars, the ACSL. These are different layers in the sky or different altitudes. That would be the lowest. Then higher up, strato cumulus, standing lenticular, and finally, cirro cumulus, standing lenticular. So these are various elevations or various heights that you'd find these, uh, you know, in the vicinity of a mountain range or downwind of a mountain. I know from a glider standpoint, you can find wave clouds, lennies, downwind. They what they call the primary, the secondary, the tertiary. These can be hundreds of miles downwind of the mountain as the mountain waves are, you know, undulating up and down, they will form these clouds. So they'll form and dissipate. So they're downstream or downwind of the mountains. Okay, and what are layered lennies? Uh, layered uh, vertically on top of each other. So you might have them stacked like pancakes, one on top of the other. So just depending on the atmospheric conditions that day, you could find them just, you know, like looking like pancakes or even like UFOs. They're just stacked vertically. Okay, and what's the biggest downdraft you've seen with mountain waves? Ooh. Oh, easily several thousand feet per minute. Four to five thousand feet per minute, uh, not uncommon. So, um or more, it just depends, um, you know, the winds aloft and how fast they are crossing a ridge line. I mean, upper level winds, there's nothing to stop them. So, you, yeah, several thousand feet a minute is entirely possible. You know, I, I fly in and out of Big Bear Airport, which is a mountain airport every week. And the rule of thumb I teach in my mountain flying classes are one knot of wind over a mountain ridge doubles in speed. And every one knot of wind is a 50 foot per minute downdraft. So a 20 knot wind right over a ridge then becomes that 40 mile an hour tailwind and that can be a 2000 foot per minute downdraft easily and that's not really a strong wind in the mountains at all no right. reina has a great question reina mink and i'm so sorry uh, if i'm messing up that name reina wants to know why was he flying so close to the ground well he actually called on his cell phone while flying <laughs> down to tell his friend uh, hey go pick me up at the paso robles airport kept him on the phone and said no no go outside and I'm going to fly over your house so you can see me fly over the house. So there was really no reason for him to be in that plateau except to buzz his friend and kind of show off. Bad judgment. Really bad judgment. So here's some rotor clouds. And rotor clouds um, really are the lowest form right. of mountain wave clearance. I know uh, layered lennies can go up to 18,000 feet. They're often called stratocumulus or fractocumulus. <coughs> Fracto is the prefix, meaning it's a broken up cloud, whereas the strato is the, the flat layered type. So fractocumulus, the clouds are simply broken up because of the high winds and that. So they're not all together, you know, just more broken up, like a broken. Okay. Yeah. So there's, they're generally tubular lines parallel to the ridge, and they look very benign and very stable. Right. But they're not. And what's important to realize is the base of the rotor clouds is generally about the same height as the ridge and going up three to 5,000 feet. But the big thing you have to know with all mountain wave clouds, rotor clouds, lenticular, and the others, John Main, is that they are always a sign of severe to extreme turbulence and can cause low level wind shear, which is what happened to this guy. <clears throat> How could we have prevented that accident? Well, I say it. Every time I speak all over the country, get a weather brief every time. 1-800-WX-BRIEF.COM makes it easy, makes it simple. It amazes me. Um, I speak at all the national shows, and, and John goes to quite a few shows as well. You are legally required to get a standard weather brief if you are leaving the traffic pattern area of your local airport. So it means if you're going out to a practice area or one other airport and back, you're legally required to get a full and complete standard weather brief. And everyone goes, well, Gary what regulation, what is this new? And I'm like, no, it's 91103. Right. You're required to have all information before you go. 
you are required to do it every single time, not just occasionally. My recommendation is, of course, I never fly cross country without uh, flight following. And I have some in-flight weather. I have some ads B. Um, remember, EFOS 122.0 has been canceled, but you can right. always get in-flight weather by calling any flight service station um, on, you know, whatever the, the nearest VOR is, and you can find that. Remember, though, that ads B and XM weather can be up to 28 minutes old, and you should be careful of getting too close to stuff. So John Townsley has a question. Are turbulent air three to five thousand feet above the ridge line well i'll let john answer too i always say if you're above the highest clouds you're probably okay but you should never fly at the level or below clouds john yeah i would agree with that i mean you want to give the uh the ridge line a wide berth in fact, that's why when I mean, going IFR, the MEs are at least 2,000 feet above the highest obstacle for, for IFR. So you want to give yourself a wide berth. Um, there's so many variables with weather. You can't say, well, I'm good here. I mean, you might be lucky one time, but the next time it could get you. People get lulled into things. They're lucky, and all of a sudden, luck runs out. Um, get, be, you, know, you want to be very conservative with this. Because if you do get yourself in a corner, you know, you want to make sure you've got good chances of getting out. Um, obviously, we should probably not be buzzing our friends' houses while talking on the cell phone. And that just goes down to a sterile cockpit below 5,000 feet AGL. There is no FAA law saying you can't use your cell phone in the cockpit. There's an FCC rule that says you're not supposed to make calls. I do use my cell phone in the cockpit during flights because I get updated weather alerts from Lockheed Martin by text oh. message. Okay. Um, I got to tell you, I don't make a whole lot of phone calls. But I have when uh, my radios have died. I've actually been cleared to land by text message at Long Beach, which is a, another story. We've got several questions, and I'm going to see if I can get to a couple. Uh, Ernie wants to know, best way to contact flight service? Look on your current chart. Um, if anybody still carries a paper chart, if not, look at your iPad. And just look at the, the nearest flight service station. They're usually centered around VORs. John Wyland has a good question for John Mahaney. Can there be mountain wave, but no clouds? Uh, there could be. I mean, if the conditions are right, you'd have to know what conditions to look for. But depending on the humidity of the atmosphere, sometimes there is not enough humidity to form a cloud. So um, I would say it's probably possible. Uh, we, we do get something called Santa Ana winds here in California, where the winds actually come from the Las Vegas desert over the Big Bear Mountains. And it's, there's no humidity to form the clouds. So we do get that occasionally. Um, John Hagel, sorry if I'm messing up names, Hagee. Uh, what about a beam or horizontal spacing from Arcus clouds when crossing uh, mountains? Well, crossing mountains, you want to cross the ridge on at least a 45 degree angle. That gives you a, you know, escape route. Um, give yourself enough altitude. So plenty of altitude and conservatively, um, also, you know, check for, um, well, if there's no visual cues, uh, pyreps, things like that, turbulence being reported. Um, this is where you really have to look and read the terrain, see what's going on with an onboard GPS. You can probably get wind information yourself. Seeing what the, what's there, you have to learn how to read the terrain, you know, uh, to see what's going on and visualize the wind being like the water and uh, to, to try to get a good idea. But I would leave yourself a wide berth. Um you don't know what you could encounter. Um, so, uh, S. San Asian, I'm so sorry, has a question. How reliable is ForeFlight and iPad weather info? Um, if you're getting in-flight weather from a Stratus or another ADS-B device, it is reliable, but it can be up to 28 minutes old. Got some good comments. Um, William Ramos says, even Southwest Airlines canceled four flights into Reno this pack, uh, past weekend due to ACL, ACSL. And rotors, yet not even the airlines mess with this. And uh, a comment from a friend of mine, John Chapman. Hey, John, upwind wave <laughs> penetration can cost you 5,000 feet per mile. Glider pilots have a lot of respect for wave systems. And what I really recommend for uh, everybody, if you have the chance, is go out and take a couple glider lessons. You will learn more about mountain wave than uh, we can ever teach you on a webinar. So these are the five ways we could have prevented this accident. And, and the most important one is look outside. 
if you are staking <coughs> full power nose up, you got a problem. Don't continue the flight path. Right. Um, the best real time weather is always looking outside the front window. And if he had looked around him at the mountain ridges and seen the, the tubular clouds, he would have known there was a problem. Right, let's move on to the second one. This is a uh, case study number two, thunderstorms and hail. And uh, this is a, a, an NTSB accident in uh, Texas. And I'm going to turn it over to John for a few seconds. And John, can you kind of talk about how hail is formed? Well, if you're above the freezing level, you've got the uh, the rain that's above the freezing level and it gets caught in the up and down drafts and it just continues to go up and down and up and down. And the longer it's in there, that's where it solidifies. When it's heavier than the updraft, then it will form. You know, when it gets into the downdraft, it will come down as hail. And also, uh, if it's heavy enough, that's when it gets tossed out the top uh, of the anvil, and it can travel, you know, five to ten miles easily. So there's numerous reports of airplane being struck by hail in the clear because there was an anvil, you know, some distance away. Great. So let's talk about some background for this info. <clears throat> this is a 2,500-hour private pilot, single and multi-engine land. Again, all three accidents I picked today, the lowest time was 2,500. This is not student pilots. Student pilots tend not to fly into dangerous <laughs> weather. They tend to be very experienced or even professional pilots that get overconfident. He had a pretty good plane. He had a Cessna 421. And, John, you taught the Cessna 421 for Flight Safety International yeah. for several years, didn't you? Two, two, and a, two and a half years, yeah. Okay. Very capable airplane. Um, oh, go ahead. It's very capable. Um, you know, when, when flown professionally, um, you know, it has, uh, I mean, it's very capable, very utilitarian. If I recall, it goes up to what tops at 30,000. They're not RVSM, but uh, with the onboard avionics and an experienced pilot, um, you know, a very good solid airplane. I believe it's 375 horse. Uh, it's a geared engine, but it's a good solid airplane. Now, in your experience, um, somebody who is, you know, a private pilot or even a commercial paid right. pilot, when they first step up to a plane like the 421, do they tend to get a little overconfident that the plane can kind of do anything? Uh, actually, sometimes they're intimidated initially until they get used to it all because it's simply more to do. And at the first, with I mean, the engine, for example, there's more to managing the engine in that airplane. Uh, once you do get comfortable with it, you can step into the uh, overconfidence realm. Uh, but, you know, most of the pilots I work with respected it and, they actually did not do much. They were they were largely uh, big white, big yellow stripe down their back. They flew the airplane very conservatively. I was I wasn't working with freight pilots that were going all the time. I was working with owner pilots that would fly on a nice day. Right. So a very capable airplane that they underutilized. <laughs> okay, um, he was in instrument conditions and he was on an IFR flight plan. It was a pretty short flight in a 421 from uh, West Houston, Texas, up to Tulsa, Oklahoma. But he <coughs> did not get a standard weather brief. You're not required to get a standard weather brief to file an IFR flight plan and get a clearance. You're just not very smart if you don't. Right. This is a picture of his plane. And as John was saying, you got two engines with 375 horsepower each. It does go up to 30,000 feet. It's pretty quick. The book says it'll do 256 knots, and uh, a lot of them do have weather radar mm -hmm. on board. Right. Now, because he did not get a standard weather brief on this flight, he did not know about this center weather advisory. So here's the valid date and time periods. And I'll read it to you. Over East Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, widely scattered thunderstorms developing ahead of a cold front over North Louisiana and East Texas, shifting eastward through the period, continuing over Far East portion beyond a time. Some severe cells possible with hail. Cell movement is going eastbound from 270 at 25 knots with tops to 48,000 feet. And, John, what's the fastest you've ever seen a thunderstorm move or, or read about a thunderstorm move? Oh, I've seen 50, 60 knots. Right. So remember, if you are looking at Adsby weather, which can be up to 28 minutes old, 
something moving 25 to 50 to 60 knots, you should never ever use an iPad or XM weather to try and navigate through thunderstorms. And if he had looked at the surface analysis, here's what he would have seen. That cold front moving directly across his route and ultimately where the accident occurred. So if we look at his IFR clearance, it was from West Houston up to Longview, the GGG VOR, then up into Tulsa, Oklahoma, right. RVS. Unfortunately, though, this was the storm that was moving through at his time of flight. And you can see red, and you can see pink, and you can see all the bad colors on, on radar. Right. So John and I are going to do a little role playing. We're going to do the actual radio communication log so you can hear what happened uh, during <coughs> that flight. Sorry, it looks like I had a duplicate slide in there. Huh. So I'm looking at the left screen. Let me just a second. Okay. Is there a TAPS report on the weather in front of me? No TAPS available. When able, direct long view. Golf, golf, golf. There is a segment for thunderstorm activity north of you moving eastbound, at which point the controller gave details of segment 5C and 6C. Moderate, heavy, and extreme precip, 11 o'clock, 40 miles moving east. Let me know if you need to deviate right. I'm looking at the weather, and we'll let you know. Now, at 319, he was given uh, an order to be switched over to Fort Worth Center, which he acknowledged, but never came up on Fort Worth Center. <coughs> And there was some uh, back and forth between radar controllers looking for him. At 323, they actually lost radar contact, and Fort Worth Center was unable to reach him. At 320, however, a new low controller, Donnie Low Controller R29, made contact with the 421. 67 Sierra Romeo, do you have weather radar on board? Yes, sir. And that's the last we ever heard from that pilot. 6 7 Sierra Romeo, direct Tulsa. Cessna, 6 7 Sierra Romeo, direct Tulsa. Cessna, 6 7 Sierra Romeo. <coughs> Golden Eagle, 6 7 Sierra Romeo. Eagle Flight 3265, can you call 67 Sierra Romeo and listen for an ELT? Uh, we got no response and no ELT. Southwest 3809, do you hear an ELT? Negative. Well, although he had onboard weather radar, we'd like to show you the radar capture of what he actually flew through with the white path being his route. So it's a little clearer if I zoom in a little bit and bolden that line. You can see he went through the heart of the strongest cell in his area. He went right through the middle of it. You can even see there's not only red, but pink, which is worse than red. Flew right through the heart of the strongest cell. And if you're wondering why they didn't hear an ELT, a lot of very severe crashes, the ELT does not go off.
because it's destroyed. And if that's what's left of a 421, there's certainly not much left of the ELT. But what's interesting is the amount of hail damage they actually did find. This is a picture of the horizontal stabilizer. If you see all those dents, those are all hail damage points. Right. And John, how much can hail really do to the flight controls and the airplane in flight? Oh, we do severe damage. Um, if you've ever seen pictures of aircraft that have survived hail and landed, they've had to reskin surfaces. Uh, they take out windshields. In fact, hail, sidebar, uh, Southern Airways, back in the 1970s, they flew into an area, very strong, it was a tenuous, very strong thunderstorm, and hail took out cockpit windshield. They flamed out two engines. Hail can do extreme damage. Take airplanes down. So there's. So yeah, you can really see, but it can absolutely make you lose flight control, maneuverability. They can break windshields, and that's not even talking about the severe turbulence and extreme turbulence you're going to be encountering at the same time. So <laughs> let's talk about some questions for John. You can have golf ball size hail. <laughs> so we talked about how fast thunderstorms can move, and he said 50 to 60 knots. So, John, how far away from thunderstorms can hail actually be thrown? I'll say, you know, 10 miles easily. Um, and all this depends on the system, what kind of, I'll say, upper-level support with the jet stream and that, and uh, how strong is the low. All these things combined, if it's moving quickly, it can throw that hail easily, you know, 10 miles or more. Uh, depends how large is the hail. It's like throwing something that's got a, a mass and inertia. So you can't say I'm in the clear. <laughs> I'm safe. You yeah. Know, you can still be, you know, you can still get it. Now, um, people do email me questions before webinars. And uh, I think this is an excellent one from Roger Hoy. Hi, Roger. Using onboard weather radar seems to be more art than science. I see you guys rotating the antenna up and down etc. and during climbs and descents. Can you relate some of your experience to the proper use and functioning of the onboard radar? And what I'd like you to also add is, what are some limitations that come with using airborne <coughs> radar? Well, the whole key to using radar correctly, um, and I have to say, having taken Archie Trammell's course and he no longer teaches it, um, he used to travel the country doing it, is the, what they call the tilt management of the radar beam depending on the size of the dish and it transmits an X band radar beam out and whatever it runs into when it returns, that's the return that you get. But it depends on, you know, your height, your deck angle up or down. And you, there's, there's math that you can use to determine. You have to find out what is level. So you can scan up and down as appropriate um, to, to, so you know what you're looking at. Um, and I know weather has evolved so much that uh, the newer weather systems have what they call stability, stabilization, uh, onboard stabilization. So when the airplane is pitching, banking, you know, nose up and nose down, the radar antenna can maintain the same uh, projection from the aircraft. So it's it's a matter of the tilt. Um, so I've got uh, some notes here from the seminar, which are years old. So after takeoff, select a mode. Um, you know, and, you know, one degree negative tilt, check the display to ensure you're seeing ground objects at least 100 miles out. At 5,000 feet, they should be 70 miles out, etc. So there's certain guidelines, pointers that you want to use when you're setting this up. Um, at the bottom of the sweep, at, at 20 miles, you know, raise the tilt um, appropriately. So you're calibrating your radar as you're flying uh, or making adjustments to seeing what's out there so that you know what you're seeing because the th thunderstorm's got vertical development. So that way you can see, you know, have a good idea of what you're scanning with the radar and interpret it properly. Uh, limitations of weather radar compared to um, next red. Weather radar is good for relatively shorter range, maybe 100, 200, 300 miles. Uh, whereas with next red, you're going to looking, you can look across the country because that's a satellite thing, even though it's a time delay. Probably the biggest limitation of weather radar is what they call attenuation which is when the rainfall is so intense, it absorbs the X band that's transmitted and it doesn't get returned. And it's when pilots unknowingly fly into that, they think there's nothing out there because nothing shows. In fact, they're flying into the heaviest part of it, which is what happened with the uh, Southern Airways DC-9 back about 40 years ago. 
they went to an area that they thought had nothing and they flew into the heart of it and they ended up crashing. So um, unfortunately, not enough pilots have taken weather courses like this, which are offered by only a few people. Um, so you really have to get an education how to use this, to use it properly. You know, it's funny because so many people hire me to come teach them Garmin 43530 and G1000. It's got to be a lot like radar. The, the Garmin avionics are more dangerous right. if you don't know how to use it. Exactly. I'm sure weather radar is great, but if you don't know how to use it. Right. Okay. Now, this is a great question from Mark. Mark, Lisa. Assuming you got the weather and then took off. Well, Mark, I'm going to stop you then. <laughs> if I had gotten that standard weather brief and if John had gotten that standard weather brief, we would not have launched. There's just no benefit to flying towards thunderstorms. But assuming you took off and had been in flight and gotten this update, what would you have done? I would have turned around and landed and waited it out. John, he wants to know, would you have deviated east, land and wait? What would you have done? Okay, then you have to ask, what kind of an airplane are you flying? What are your capabilities as far as fuel and speed and endurance? If you could safely, you know, deviate around wide berth, possibly, but if you're flying a typical single engine, you don't have that kind of capability, you might be better off to turn around, land where you took off or a nearby suitable airport and wait it out. If you do have the capability, the speed and the range and the altitude to safely divert around it, wide berth, you might consider that on the upwind side, so it's moving away from you. So these are all things you want to consider. And the, this particular band of storms, even though he was in a 421, was several hundred miles long. It, it stretched from Austin to Shreveport, Louisiana. There, it was not, you're really not going around this one. Um, but, you know, you can certainly, if you want to fly that, that far out of the way. Great question. All right, we've got several questions here. David Goffman. Hi, David. Can traffic control predict the flight path of the pilot, especially on an IFR flight path, and help prevent the accident on their experience. Um, they can certainly provide suggestions. However, in my experience, they are, are very busy and their radar is not always right. as good as NEXRAD. They certainly can make suggestions. And uh, I think in this case, it was pretty clear they were trying to help. They gave him the SIGMETs. They said there's 40, you know, there's heavy and extreme precept in front of you. They asked, do you have weather radar? Um, I just don't think he took um, advantage of it. Uh, John, do you have anything to say about air traffic controllers helping with this kind of stuff? Um, they try to be as helpful as they can, but their radar is primarily designed to, you know, paint metal, not precipitation. Uh, they paint the what the H on the screen, so they're getting <coughs> uh, feedback from others that they're talking with. I mean, they can they have an idea from what everyone's trying to do, deviating around it, but their returns aren't going to be as good as weather radar returns. So um, um, I, I don't know the state of air traffic control weather, but theirs is, is you know, their radar is designed for metal, not for precip. So um, controllers can only help you so much, you know, and they can't uh, decide for you. All right. Um, here's a good one from James Gurner. Does hail always get thrown downwind of the cell in the direction of the anvil? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's thrown in all directions, isn't it? Well, if it's going to come out the top, I've always heard it going downwind, but um, it could, um, you know, I would say it could probably go upwind as well. Uh, it would seem more likely to go with the anvil downwind. It would make sense. Um, Richard Hubble, can you comment on the weather displayed on the iPad? I'm the iPad guy. Um, Adsby weather is wonderful, but it has some significant limitations, especially with thunderstorm radar. Um, it can be up to 28 minutes old from what you see, and something moving at 25 to 40 knots, 28 minutes old is not very helpful. There have been serious injuries and significant accidents, and I honestly believe it's only a matter of time. Um, until they can prove thunderstorm fatalities were caused by people trying to use iPad weather to go through them. Um, it's, it's great for long range planning, but never trying to navigate around or through them. Rob, hey Rob, how long would it have taken for thunderstorms to have gone past his planned route of flight? 
Well, it was moving at 25 knots. Um, and from the information in the NTSB accident, it looks pretty clear to me, um, and, and I did more research on this, but it looked pretty clear to me that if he had waited an hour and a half to two hours, he would have had a clear flight there. But again, because he did not get the standard weather brief, you know, it's just not, not there. So Ethan, so it sounds like flight service is still the best to ask regarding weather while en route versus iPad uh, ads be correct. Uh, yeah, I actually take whatever I get on the iPad and then I verify it with flight service and other pirates. All right, well, let's move on. There are several other questions, but uh, let's move on. How could we have prevented this accident? Well, <laughs> seems to be a recurring theme in, in, in my life that if you get a standard weather brief, know the limitations to weather radar right. and simply never try to fly through thunderstorms. It's killed airliners, it's killed fighter jets, and it will certainly take down a 421. <laughs> um, thunderstorms, just it just doesn't work out. I have a pretty conservative thing. Um, I really like to stay more than 25 nautical miles away from all thunderstorms. I used to say 50 miles, um, but all my friends in Texas and Florida told me if they had to stay 50 miles away from thunderstorms, they could never fly. So uh, I cut it down to, to 25 nautical miles. So a question came up. Uh, could the pilot have used an outside weather service? We don't know, and that's one of the requirements to get a standard weather brief. Um, a standard weather brief means somebody at the FAA can prove it later. So anything you do through DUOT, DUOT, the four flight servers through FlyQ, WingX on the iPad, if it tracks your airplane number, the time, the route, your name, that's all proof of a legal weather brief. I just can't possibly imagine a, that the 421 driver had seen that band of thunderstorms and decide to launch anyway. It just doesn't make sense to me, but it, but it's possible. Yeah. Case number three and our last one of the night is all about microburst. And uh, this is one also out of the central office. So I want to show you how powerful a microburst really is. And you kind of got to watch the video um, pretty closely, you're going to see just a huge onrush of downdraft moist air and how fast it moves. This is pretty easy to find on YouTube if you simply uh, Google Tucson microburst. So you can see the Virga and there's that microburst and see how fast it overwhelms and comes out. So let's talk about the background for this accident. This guy was not new. He had 3,500 hours as a private pilot. Interestingly enough, his uh, flight review had been expired by about six months, but he flew on a regular basis, and this was a day VFR uh, trip. With It was just a personal flight with three of his friends. He wanted to take them up on a little sightseeing flight over the mountains, once again, he did not get a standard weather brief, although he did talk to a flight service briefer. Um, he did not get the full and complete weather brief. So some interesting METAR data. When he took off, it was 180 at 11, gusting 18. But I want you to look at 1535. So this was uh, an automated METAR. The wind was 180 at 4 knots, 10 miles visibility scattered at 10,000, temperature 22, dew point minus 3, and the altimeter was 3004. 20 minutes later, during the microburst, it was significantly different. The wind was 270 at 21, gusting 28, and everything else remains the same. You'll notice the temperature dropped a little bit. 
but the wind shear, uh, the wind shift in a matter of minutes was huge. So this is his flight path using a Bonanza. And you can see how the 20 knot quartering tailwind with gusts up to 28 or even 30 nautical miles at points blew him far off the final. And he had to do a 60 degree bank to turn back to final. This is the point where you go around. This is the point where people stall spin. <clears throat> this is the point where everything's going wrong. If you have to do a 60 degree bank to line up with the runway, go around. He, of course, did not. They say the airplane was rocking. He was visibly fighting to stay on final. The first touchdown really means he, he bounced <laughs> at that point far down the runway. All three gear didn't cut down until two thirds down the runway, at which point he went power idle. Then he went full power and attempted to go around by pitching up, but leaving full flaps and his gear down, which does not work very well. At which point he uh, entered a 10 degree turn and power on stalled. Again, just a little bit easier to see from a slightly different viewpoint. You can see bounce, touchdown, and go around with only what they estimated of 1,800 feet left on the runway out of a 5,400 foot total length of the runway. Um, he didn't even bounce until two thirds down the runway. Again, a good clue to go around. So I want to show you uh, the lightning strikes current uh, at the time of this accident. So those are all the lightning strikes. And it's even easier to see if we overlay the radar that he was flying into. So there's no way he could have not seen the storm clouds if he'd been looking outside. And he flew directly into the thunderstorm was just off the edge of the airport, uh, just past where he tried to go around. And that's where microburst really happened. She'd never go anywhere near an airport with a thunderstorm off the end. <laughs> and, and like I say, and there's his flight path. Um, and this has killed many airlines in the Midwest. American Airlines lost several due to microburst. And I know other airlines have as well in the 70s and 60s. So here's a witness statement from somebody who was standing at the airport. The aircraft slowed and I expected to see hard braking. However, I got the sense that the pilot started to brake, but at that moment where he was even with the east side windsock, then he heard the Bonanza go full power and attempt to go around. The plane went off the end of the runway and actually dropped below the plateau. He was still airborne and gaining air altitude slightly. Flaps and gear were still full down. He then started a slight right turn. With that, he stalled and dropped out of my sight again. Within a few seconds, I saw a column of black smoke. And much as bad as the other two, there's just not much <coughs> left when you stall spin an airplane. Uh, you know, in these severe weather conditions, there's just not much left. Now, what's interesting is uh, in the NTSB dockets, which are available to anybody, you can actually look all this information up. The NTSB investigator sent Textron engineers who own Cessna and Beechcraft and, <laughs> right. and, and other stuff. They actually sent the Textron engineers saying, you know, could he have stopped in the time and the, in the distance. And the engineer responded back, well, a review of the landing distance data presented by the POH indicates that the pilot would have needed at least 1,720 feet of runway from the point of touchdown to stop the airplane. So the way, runway used was 3.5, airport elevation, outside air temperature, wind, 226 at 20 knots with gust. At 20 knots, not counting the gusts that gave him a tailwind component of 11.2 knots. 
I've highlighted note two. The tailwind component exceeds the maximum value of 10 knots for which landing distance is provided in the POH. So the Beechcraft POH doesn't even give you values for landing with a more than 10 knot tailwind. Um, it was slightly below the maximum demonstrated crosswind component, but uh, not by much. One of the things John and I are both big on mountain flying, this is something called a Koch chart, which you need to understand and use before you go into the mountains. And basically, it's a way of determining your aircraft performance in the hills. All you really need to do is just draw a line from the airport temperature to the pressure altitude, which that day uh, was just above 6,000 feet. You'll see the red line crosses <coughs> anywhere between 0.3 and 0.4, so maybe 0.33 or 0.35. That is the percentage of climb rate you would get from your airplane at sea level performance. Oh. Also, you'll notice on the takeoff distance line, that's crossing at about 2.5 or 2.6, <coughs> meaning you would need 260% more takeoff distance to oh. successfully take off. So if he had leaned it perfectly without a tailwind, he would have had a climb factor of only 35% of normal if he had put the flaps and the gear up, but he did not retract either. So what kind of climb factor you get with a 10 to 12 knot gusting tailwind with full flaps and gear down is uh, probably what happened there. So got a couple questions. Lito T. Novato. Hi, Lito. What onboard equipment do you recommend for GA aircraft to obtain real-time weather? Look outside. The best real-time weather is absolutely looking outside. I do recommend ADSB or XM Weather backing it up by uh, giving PIREPS and getting in-route weather through flight service. Yeah, John? Actually, also, if StormScope is still out there, that was a good backup because um, that identifies the electromagnetic impulses. They show up and so you can compare that. It's just another tool, a uh, storm scope. It was popular 20, 30 years ago. Don't know if it's still out there, but uh, it's one of many tools that are available. The Mark One eyeball is still the best. Richard Treat has a great comment. He's a retired airline pilot. Hi, Richard. Our wind shear microburst go around actions are not to change our configuration. That is, keep gear and flaps where they are right. until you are free of the shear. Right. Is that different in a small airplane? Yes, absolutely, because we do not have the power you do. It is critical in all go-arounds to reduce drag <laughs> as fast as you can. That means gear up immediately and then flaps to the short field takeoff setting. So in a Cessna 172, if you're at flaps 30, you don't go flaps up. You go to flaps 10 because at flaps 10, you're producing more lift than drag. You never want to raise flaps all the way up suddenly because then you get a sinking action. But yeah, when when we're talking any type of piston or even, you know, I, I was a captain on a caravan with 675 shaft horsepower with a, a PT-6. Absolutely, the gear was fixed. I couldn't do anything about that. But flaps immediately to the short field takeoff position. We just don't have the, the power. Um is a Koch chart unique to an aircraft, make, model, etc.? No. Um, the only thing is uh, you do need to make some adjustments if your airplane is turbocharged. But it really is showing you the percentage of stuff you get. So, microburst questions for John. John, how, how big is a microburst? Oh, could uh, be, you know, a mile across laterally, side to side. So it's, it's really, you know, fairly well-defined and focused. Um, thus, it has a stronger downdraft and being called a microburst. So it's got more energy in a smaller area. And, and then when it hits the ground, it can <laughs> rapidly retire. Yeah. And if you can see what it does to vegetation, it will flatten the vegetation below it. So uh, it's the outburst at the bottom that will uh, really... Also ruin your day. How intense can the downdrafts 
and oh. the winds be in a micro uh, oh. microburst. Five six thousand feet a minute down is uh, not uncommon. So you know, figure yeah, a mile a minute vertically down. Only a few aircraft can outclimb that. <laughs> yeah, you know, six thousand feet per minute down is is uh, you know not real good. <laughs> Um, a 15 maybe but not and much. if the surface winds are 45 knots that can actually right. result in a 90 uh, knot wind shear sure and 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 I don't care if you're flying a triple seven right a 90 knot loss of speed right is, is gonna bring that airplane down right are there some visual signs that uh, pilots can look for to suspect a microburst might be there? Or any kind of uh, convective activity, thunderstorm activity, which might result, which might generate a microburst, um, doesn't have to be, but that's what it would typically be. Um, I've also encountered microbursts on days where there was no clouds in the sky; just it was just local terrain and orographic features resulted in one. But more than likely, you're going to have some sort of convective uh, frontal activity that's going to generate this. And great question from Robert Teft. Hi, Robert. Was there an ASOS at the Whiskey Creek Airport? There was weather reporting. Um, if so, why would the pilot have landed in that direction? Well, you know, it's not so much about listening to the ASOS, although I agree with you, he should have been listening to it. Um, but, again, looking out the front window, if your ground speed is way faster than what you expect, if you're blown where it takes a 60-degree bank to get back to the runway, that should have been his clue uh, to go around. Now, if he had listened to the ASOS before landing, uh, yes, he should have actually just gone away. He could see, and it was visible to witnesses, the thunderstorm activity uh, just past the end of the runway. So I don't know if an ASOS would have so much helped his decision, um, but it certainly would have helped mine. Uh, I would have listened to the ASOS 20 miles out and uh, simply gone to a, a different airport. Hey, John, how long can a microburst last? Uh, here's a, a good guide is the more intense the weather, the shorter the duration because it takes so much energy. I had a weatherman tell me that one time, but I would say for 10 to 15 minutes. So it's going to be relatively short-lived. Um, it takes a lot of energy to generate this. So it's not likely to last for a long time, relatively you know, sh short, and then uh, waiting for a system to move through. It's associated with maybe a squall line or something like that, and then it moves on. So. I want to actually ask you that something you said really kind of got my attention. The stronger the microburst, the shorter the duration. Well, actually, the the stronger a weather. System oh, the stronger is, the thunderstorm. The stronger a weather system is, the more energy it takes. So the shorter in duration. Because it just burns itself out it, faster. Right now, um, yes. So it's not an absolute rule, but it tends to apply. Something is very intense. It's going to. I mean, tornadoes last typically a short time. Very, very uh, high energy situation. Okay. Paula Bre Breton, Breton, I'm so sorry, Paula. Hi. Um, how is a gust front different from a microburst? A gust front is not coming down. It's it's a fast moving cold front that's coming through and it's hitting you with a, uh, it's the leading edge. Think of a gust front as a squall line. It's, bef it's in front of the front and it's coming through with a blast of colder air changing in speed and direction from the air that's already been there. So it's displacing that with a gust of air from a different direction. It's not vertical, it's horizontal. Excellent, thanks. So let's all talk about how we could have prevented this accident. Number one, just don't exceed <laughs> the aircraft or the pilot capabilities. One of the things, uh, and I just sold my flight school after 11 years, but what I've taught people for years is the maximum demonstrated crosswind component in your POH is not a limitation. Right. That's what a professional test pilot was willing to do at the factory. Right. Unless you are a professional <laughs> test pilot with several thousand hours in that type of airplane, just because the book says you can do it doesn't mean you can. I've put down uh, a Cessna 172 in a crosswind that was greater than the POH limitation, but after 6,000 hours, um, I had actually had the ability to do it as I've gotten older and, and some say wiser, <coughs> my best crosswind landing is a go around to another airport without the crosswind. <laughs> That's good. 
And that brings me to things we teach in mountain flying all the time, and this was certainly a mountain flying accident. Go around is typically done in mountains before you are lined up with the runway. It's very common to go around on base uh, or even downwind and decide this is not working out. Certainly when he turned base to final with the, the ground clues uh, and, and the turbulence he was fighting, he should have gone around then before he attempted the land. Um, it is unfortunately very easy to second guess people who have died. We don't know what was going through his mind. I will tell you there are several medical studies that back up the fact that there is not much difference between adrenaline and a frontal lobotomy. <laughs> Um, it, it's actually true once you get scared intense that you tend to make horrible decisions because the frontal cortex, which is where you make your decisions, is drugged up on adrenaline. So when you read accident reports, it's very easy to go, oh, my God, they were dumb. Oh, my God, they were stupid. Why didn't they do this? The problem is, is that once people get into the situations and the adrenaline starts hitting it, then they tend to make worse decisions, uh, very similar to the JFK accident. If he, if he had pushed autopilot heading altitude, the plane would have flown straight. Right. He couldn't make that decision because of the adrenaline flow at that point. So uh, don't make fun of certainly people who, who passed away in these accidents. They, they were doing the best they can at the time. The lessons we want to take is uh, just not to get in those situations. Uh, Rob Bennett has a great question. Um, what about practicing crosswind landings with a flight simulator? Uh, flight simulator? Uh, certainly, uh, the flight simulators that John teaches in, full motion sims, could do some good. Uh, the basic ATD simulator I have is not really good for landing. I know Redbird makes a product that is a, a pretty good specifically for that, but I've not used it. Number three, I think we said it again and again and again. Look outside. Remember, the best real-time weather view is always outside the front uh, window. Uh, William Ramos has a great uh, comment. In bad wind, I recommend a long final to have more time to assess the situation right. and have time to go around or go away. William, that's a great comment and a very good suggestion. So let's talk about the takeaways uh, we'd like everybody to leave with tonight. One, uh, experience can build overconfidence. Uh, you know, the more time you have, the more likely you are to make some dumb mistakes. Right. A lot of severe weather accidents really happen to high time pilots. They really, really do. Get a weather brief every single time. Learn and follow aircraft limitations. Get mountain flying training before you go in the mountains. Yes. Got to tell you, uh, many of the accidents at Big Bear are actually flight instructors who have never taken mountain flying training. There is no mountain training in private commercial instrument, right. ATP, flight instructor, there is no mountain training. Um, and I promise you, Aspen will kill right. six 10,000 hour ATPs with turbojets just as fast as Big Bear will kill a 2,000 hour flight instructor. If you have not taken a formal mountain flying course, I really recommend you simply do not go into the mountains. And I treat right. mountain flying starting at three and 4,000 <coughs> feet um, because I witness two to three accidents every single year at Big Bear wow. from people who are simply not qualified to fly in the mountains. Uh, I do a basic mountain flying course and some uh, mountain flying adventures here in Southern California. One of the, the best in the world is McCall Mountain Flying in Idaho, which, John, I think you've done, right? Yeah, I did that gosh in 01. Hard to put it in the Lori McNichol McCall Mountain Canyon Flying. It's a four-day course, classroom. You fly in the morning, you spend the afternoon in class. Um, and the, they used to give you credit, wings credit for it as well. Um, so, in fact, if you go to the Mountain Flying website, um, their website, you'll find one of my comments at the end of the course. It was it was simply an awesome course. My first exposure to the backcountry with them, I was uh, 
humbled and I realized that even though I thought I knew something, I learned a lot. So I can't recommend that enough. Right. And, and there are some uh, really good people in Alaska, <laughs> the Rocky Pilots Association and some people in Colorado do some wonderful right. yeah. courses. Um, but uh, several mountain, out there. Yeah, mountain flying is so different and mountain weather can change so quickly. Uh, I actually posted <clears> on my personal Facebook uh, and I'll have to tweet it out to everybody um, a picture uh a combined picture of a weather.com showing me the current weather in Big Bear was uh, calm, clear, and a 0% chance of precipitation. And then I combined that with the picture out my front window of a heavy snowstorm. <laughs> so the mountain weather can uh, oh, yeah. change so quickly. Um, it's just unbelievable. The mountain winds every time. Um, what are the mountain flying course approximate standards? Depends on the student, five hours, 10 hours in the air ground time. Right. You know, you know, Mark, it depends on who's given it. Um, I do a six <coughs> to seven hour, one day intro course, six to seven hour, one day intro course, which is typically two and a half hours of flight time. Uh, on some of the seven day courses I do, you may come out with 25, uh, or 30 hours. Um, so Catherine says, "Is oh, go ahead, John." Well, McCall, they had, as I recall, they had one for a minimum piloting command time, not flight time. A PIC, I think, was two fifty. In other words, they didn't want to wet, you know, wet behind the ears private pilot. The airplane had to have at least two hundred fifty horse, and they wanted recency of experience. So if you haven't flown in ten years, don't even talk to them. But what have you done in the last ninety days, thirty days, sixty days, that sort of thing, um, and including practicing slow flight, so that when you go up there, you don't you're, you you can transition and, into the and, course. And that's just to enroll in the program, right? They want someone that's been flying this recent and that meets these parameters. That way, you don't get up there and find out, oh, gee, you're wasting their time. So right. if you're not up to speed, you know, don't show up. Right. Um, Catherine Walker has a question: Is mountain flying considered three thousand feet AGL and above? That's what I consider. Mountain flying. Now, right. you don't need formal mountain flying training to fly over a mountain range right. at 2,000 feet. Right. You need formal mountain flying training to take off and land at mountain airports. So I want to be very, very clear. Um, I live in <coughs> Southern California. I live in Anaheim next door to Disneyland. And I live in Big Bear that uh, has 10,000 foot mountains around it. If you're flying at 11,000 feet, from Long Beach over the Cone Pass with 7,000 foot range to Vegas, you don't need a mountain flying course. If you're going to land at Big Bear, you need mountain flying. So, uh, but all of these, of course, are personal opinions. Right. Michael Precup, if I use the brief button on my four flight program, does that count as a standard weather brief? Yep. If it generates a legacy briefing for you, it absolutely does. Um, Steve Bunch. Do you know the approximate lag time for weather info on an iPad with ADS-V um, flying below 10,000 feet? It varies, but radar can be up to 28 minutes old. And uh, there's a lot of, satellite. some things are almost instantaneous and some have a lot of processing and transmitting times. So uh, you may get a METAR in two minutes, but a radar picture um, right. maybe uh -huh. may have... <laughs> William Ramos, John, I took a Cessna 414 course from you at Flight Safety. Holy I God. now have over a thousand <laughs> hours in the 414. Good for you. Yay, excellent. Excellent. So I want to talk about the famous last words <laughs> that every pilot in a fatal accident said. Yes. <clears throat> yes, I can make it. Those are almost always the famous last words of a pilot involved in a fatal aircraft accident. Learn to say no. Don't go. Um, there are some people, um, some very well-respected authors that uh, say, well, Gary, you know, you're too conservative. And I say, yes, but I've never hit a mountain. You're still around. I'm still around. <clears throat> so I tend to be very, very conservative. But when you think, yes, I can make it, that's generally a good sign to uh, stop, park the airplane, and uh, go open up some orange juice and champagne. There you go. So if you have any questions that we didn't answer or just kind of any questions on anything, or if you're watching this as a recording, 
what I want you to do is simply open up any web browser. Ah. Go over to www.pilotsafety.org. Oh. Click on Ask the Experts. That's uh, actually sponsored by Vemco Insurance Company. I, I don't know if you know, but Vemco Insurance is actually the national sponsor of the Wings program. Hmm. Type in your name, uh, or you can use a nickname like Super Pilot. You'll see we have uh, three of the California 13 master instructors that volunteer their time to answer questions. And, of course, uh, John Mahaney sitting next to me <laughs> is one of them. Type in whatever question you would like. What should we put in? So I'm not sure if I should buy radar for my airplane. And then type the the oh. the the uh, person you'd like to answer it. And this is a question <coughs> for John Mahaney. And then when you hit submit, that'll just take you back to our homepage. And uh, I do want to reinforce that everybody who volunteers for pilot safety is a volunteer. Uh, we do not return emails at midnight and we've had people get upset because we didn't answer them at midnight. Um, you can also click on videos and watch a bunch of free videos, uh, including a replay of this uh, starting tomorrow and you'll get an email with those details. But uh, when you answer questions, one, we don't know when the, uh, FAA is eliminating the third class medical. We don't know either, so you should probably stop asking. Um, I would call AOPA. They seem to be more in the know of that than I am. Um, keep it fairly simple and give us one to two days because uh, all of our volunteers really are volunteers and they work. William Ramos has a comment. My buzzword is probably. As soon as I think I can probably make it, I change plans. Right. Steve Bunch, what charts do you recommend pilots flying within 500 miles of uh, LAX, essentially, download and study during their weather briefing? Well, um, if you get a standard weather briefing, you're going to see all of the required charts either using 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM, which is amazing. And there's a free video on our website. They'll teach you how to use it. Um, if you're using ForeFlight, Flight 2, <coughs> Wing X, any of the iPads, um, if you get a standard weather briefing, you need to look at, um, I always look at the surface analysis is what I always, I always really kind of start at the surface analysis. And then I start looking at radar pictures. John, what are your favorite uh, charts to look at? Uh, the, uh, let's see, the um, 500 millibar, the four panel prog chart, the uh, 500 millibar is one at level 180, then you got the 750, um, 850 in the surface. So get a whole, get, get the, the synoptic there. And then from there, you can go into, um, you know, well, they're doing with me uh, essays, but um, area forecasts are one way, but terminal forecast, you know, METARs. Uh, so I start with the big picture, then work my way down and, you know, and, and, and go that way. Um, and then also, you know, no TAMs that might be applicable, finding out what approaches may or may not be available and that sort of thing. But, uh, years ago I worked in the national weather service office. I wasn't a weatherman, but I, a lot of folks taught me some stuff and it was always start with the big picture, work down to the little stuff. Cause if I've had people say, I checked the, the ATA, you know, I got the weather, I checked the ATA. It's like, no, you didn't. Yeah. So you got a little yeah. snapshot. Yeah, they, they, so this is not really start enough. big and work your way down. And that way, um, you'll get the general idea of, and, you know, where is, you know, looking for low pressure, low pressure is generally going to generate weather. Um, northeast corner of the lows where you find a lot of precip, um, fronts, that sort of activity. So um, looking at everything and start putting it together. And in fact, uh, you know, flying the weather maps, severe weather flying, some of the books. I've got a collection over the years, but I start big and work down. Then for the update, I get more specific. Stephen Walker, why is slow flight used for weather problems? Um, it's not, I think you may have misunderstood us. You have to be uh, good at slow flight before you take a mountain flying oh, course. Oh, maneuvering. It's all about um, maneuvering. It's all about maneuvering. Um, it's, it's not something that we do in uh, weather problems. Um, the reason for maneuvering and slow flight, you want to learn what margin you have over the stall 
because the traffic patterns in the mountainous airports are not conventional. So you want to know exactly, you want to get speeds and power settings to know how to safely fly it and what kind of a margin you have. And if you don't have enough of a margin, then you, then you don't go in. But that way you set up a parameter. It's the equivalent of a landing data card for a big airplane. So you're figuring out what speeds and power settings will give you a safe margin over a stall. So right. you keep yourself out of trouble. John Townsley uh, has the last comment. And uh, many, many people are saying great seminar. And we appreciate all that. Um, thank you. And, and we feel the same way about you. Um, John has the last comment. One of my concerns with four flight weather briefing is interpretation. How to interpret the weather can vary significantly by the region. Um, John, that's true. And I'll tell you the way I get a standard weather briefing every time. I get a full and complete standard weather briefing using 1-800-weatherbrief.com. Then I call a briefer and ask them questions on things I'm not sure about. So I actually get a full and complete weather briefing. <coughs> then I call the briefer. Um, for instance, I was delivering a, a brand new Cessna from uh, Oklahoma. And uh, I called up the briefer one day and said, hey, um, I know a thunderstorm just passed, but I've never seen the uh, abbreviation TSFLCW. Follow on quadrants. And um, <laughs> yeah. he said, well, that was actually thunderstorms with flying cows, which is very <laughs> common in Oklahoma, uh, apparently. Funnel clouds on quadrants. Oh, okay. I, I thought it was flying clouds. Um, so um, if anybody wants to talk to me, uh, I'm at masterflighttraining.com. And I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Um, we're actually doing a very special webinar tomorrow night. Uh, there is a $19 fee because it pays for all the free stuff that Pilot Safety does. Um, it's uh, me again for an hour to 90 minutes teaching you pro tips on how to use the G1000 for IFR approaches. Um, and it's, it's not a simulator. It's going to be all real in-flight uh, movies and data, and we think you'll enjoy it. If you'd like to sign up for the G1000 IFR use webinar on the 4th, uh, you can sign up now at pilotsafety.org. Everybody, thank you so much for attending. Um, I think we answered as many questions as either one of our voices will allow, but feel free to email us uh, any time. And uh, thanks, everybody, 